Hello everybody, we are live. My name's Anthony Pepper. With me this afternoon is my friend Frank Griffith. We'll be back in about five minutes or so after we've heard the mooch. Hello.
the merch there from the popular Duke Ellington 1966. Welcome. We are the Duke Ellington Society UK Online. Uh, in a moment, uh, Frank will be uh, on to talk about clarinetists and so on, but I just wanted to mention at the start here some exciting news. Um, I spent some time this week uploading the past episodes of Uptown Lockdown to YouTube. Um, so we now have a YouTube channel and hopefully, hopefully, week by week, uh, we'll be able to keep that archive up to date with the latest episode. So this one should be going up this evening, for example. Um, also exciting news, um, we're now accepting donations from you. If you'd like to help support the show and enable us to continue to do what we're doing, um, it's quite a commitment for Frank and myself and indeed for our guests. Um, and so anything would be appreciated to help us uh, be able to continue. Um, and we have both um, a PayPal link where you can uh, donate directly, either a one-time or a recurring donation, um, and also a Patreon page as well, uh, where you can subscribe for various amounts on a recurring basis. Um, and all of those details can be found on our website, which I will put up uh, here. So dukeellington.org.uk, if you go there and click on Uptown Lockdown, and then you will see the details, the YouTube channel link. So do go and subscribe there and have a look at some of the older programmes again. And uh, as I say, uh, support links as well for PayPal and for Patreon. On Patreon, uh, if you subscribe at the higher tiers uh, as, a, as a come on, to uh, to get you to subscribe um we're offering some cds aren't we frank yeah, um yeah. so at the second level people will get a copy of your, i don't have a copy with me but anyway of your uh cd the coventry suite which i see you have on your music stand there behind you brilliant stuff yeah it's a cd i recorded um uh if i can just say a couple of things yes about please it. do frank yes. we're on it um and we'll be playing a track if we have time at the end of the show from the CD. Oh, will, will, will we? Okay, good. Uh, it's a uh, very, very popular favorite of Ellington Band, written by Duke. I don't think it was uh, written by Billy. It's called um, I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart. Uh, and we've sent you this track in the past, some of the regular listeners. And it features wonderful Trudy Kerr. Who was a singer? I, I should say, is a singer who was a guest on the show about yes. six weeks ago. That's right. And uh, uh, Trudy's um, Australian um, from Brisbane, but she's been based in the UK for about thirty years, I think. And she's just a fantastic singer. So we look forward to sharing that with you, and I'll say a bit more about it later. But the uh, CD was recorded uh, through the uh, auspices of City of Coventry which is where my son was born. It just happens to be. And uh, we wrote a piece um, for that jazz festival, the Coventry Jazz Festival, which is, sure. I don't think is still going. But um, anyway, uh, it was commissioned by the city of Coventry. And we uh, learned a lot through that experience. And it was performed next door to the new rebuilt uh, Coventry Cathedral, which of course was bombed in 1939. But let's not get too uh, maudlin now. <laughs> um, so that that's a, uh, we included a lot of other music on the CD, uh, including Duke Ellington's uh, "I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart." So um, that will be. I'll let Anthony Anthony explain more detail, but a part of a um, kind of a care package. Yes, that's know. right. A kind of tote bag, if you like. Yeah, um, tell, tell, tell them a little bit more about how. That yeah, works. So, so so please do consider supporting us. Um, and the fact of the matter is that it's quite a commitment to us, and there are various incidental costs, which, to be honest, the uh, the society itself, out of its general financing, um, really can't afford. Um, so it's a bit like handing around a hat at a meeting, which is something I've done very, uh, very many times in the past, and just <laughs> taking it. It's very look, a hat, much like this one here. It's pretty cold, by the way. The weather's definitely turned. It just, is. just as of yesterday, the other day, I was putting on sunscreen to go out, but um, 
anyway, we are we are English. Well, Frank is almost English, and we yeah, do... now you're putting on snow skiing. We do enjoy talking about the weather. We don't absolutely. You know, we quite enjoy the weather, but we enjoy talking about it. So yes. So the fact is, uh, when you subscribe to the magazine, a considerable proportion of what I'm sorry, I'll start that again. Take two. When you subscribe to the society. Definitely a Freudian slip there. When you subscribe to the society and become a member, a good amount of what you there we go of what you pay us goes in producing this wonderful actual tactile real life paper uh, publication. Let's do that. And so there's not that much left over for other activities except for administration, um, basically. So as I say, the the hat is out. Please consider, as I say, going to our website, uh, Uptown, uh, <laughs> clicking on the Uptown Lockdown link, and then uh, either supporting us on uh, through PayPal or on Patreon. And if you subscribe at the second level, you'll get a copy of that CD. And if you subscribe at the higher level, you'll get a copy of this double CD too. This Lovely. is oh. this is also Frank Griffith. <laughs> Um, but not exclusively so. This is a CD which is quite close to my heart. It was produced by myself and Derek Else after we held, uh, we being a small group of people from the society, including uh, those two people and a couple of others, um, the Ellington 2008 conference in London in 2008. And we recorded the music uh, that was performed and put out an album with selections from it. And this one is mostly the Brian Priestley group, which Derek got Brian to put together to feature the Ellingtonians that we had over the musicians from the Ellington Orchestra. Um, Buster Cooper, late Buster Cooper now, uh, John Lamb and Art Barron. Um, and who's a drummer? Um, it was a great group, um, including the, men the musicians you mentioned, led and arranged by Brian Priestley. Yes. Who I'm happy to announce will be a guest on the show in a couple of weeks. Dave Barry. Dave Barry was a drummer. There we go. Sorry. Yes, just... Yeah. And uh, uh, Brian uh, arranged uh, several yes. Ellington numbers for the sextet. And it was just a wonderfully attended performance. I think it was on a Sunday afternoon. It was, I know. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it was a wonderful okay. day. We had and the whole... Kudos to Anthony and sadly the late Derek L for organizing and uh, putting together the CD. And I, if I should say so myself, a rather healthy amount of liner notes, which you can't see because of uh, the fact that it's too small to print, but... No, uh, no there's lots of liner see, notes, yes. See that there was Indeed. a lot of very oh all the, all the details there but pl plus a, a double page a4 uh sheet with uh, full oh. personnel and all of that yes anyway so uh there are some interesting pieces on here including um parachute jump yes <laughs> um and uh, so in a, mellow, in a mellow tone mood indigo that's right Sultry serenade. so anyway we're not here just to hawk our wares but it's definitely just to mention i by the way i thought these were out of stock i took the, what i thought were the last few of these um to one of the conferences a few years ago and more or less if not quite gave them away to people and i thought i was then out of stock however going through a drawer the other day i found that i had just a few copies just squirreled away there um, so if you subscribe to us at the higher level on Patreon, you'll get a copy of that sent to you in the post, a physical copy, and also uh, Frank's CD, the Coventry Suite there as well. Okay. So that's enough plugging, although we will mention it again before we go. Um, let's get on with the actual content and why you might actually wish to uh, help us out here. As, as I say, thank you for your consideration. So Frank, the clarinet. Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm not going to talk, I'm going to play. Oh this track we heard. Now, before I go any further, Anthony, can you please remind me who the singer was on the 1928 version of The Mooch? Baby Cox. Baby Cox? Yes. What a lovely name. What a wonderful name. <laughs> uh, she was presumably uh, contemporaneous with um, Adelaide Hall, I think. Well, they were alive at the same time. So, yes, I don't actually really know much about Baby Cox. I do remember looking her up 
at a, an earlier interval and not really finding a lot. Well, this was, um, I think, a good song to introduce this program because it was obviously um, written and recorded in the late 20s. But yes. of course, it continued to be a regular part of Duke's repertoire. And you heard the 1966 version, which, of course, was, you know, quite late in Duke's career. Uh, as a clarinet player and uh, a lifelong student and fan of Ellington's writing, I quite liked the piece, the same reason I liked Mood Indigo, which was a few years later, and that it featured the clarinet in that kind of wailing but subdued manner, as uh, presumably uh, Barney Bigard demonstrated in the original version. Uh, that re version we just heard was Probably Russell Procope, I would guess. Okay, we're just guessing. It could have been Hamilton, but Hamilton it was a very had a very modern style compared to Procope. I Let think. me just go in to, to, to just break in there and say yes, indeed. And we sh I should also mention, I should always mention this, that we have a chat room where you can actually chat with us so if you wish to discuss whether it was jimmy hamilton or russell procope then please do go again to our website dukeellington.org.uk click on the link to go to our discord chat room and anything that you post there will come through to my phone here and we can have a bit of a chat about it if you like sorry frank go I, on, I certainly would be interested in hearing um what who how in 1966 but you got this thing in the clarinet, which is called the chalamo register, which is very low register. Chalamo, of course, being a French word um, from uh, this uh, instrument you're looking at now, was actually an outgrowth of the clarion and the chalamo, which became the clarinet. Okay, and we're talking about 200 years ago or so. But you have this lovely sound. <laughs> New Orleans sound really because uh, every or well, a lot of Ellington uh, listeners love the fact that Duke loved his New Orleans musicians you know and those included the great uh, Barney the guard yeah and uh, another guy called Otto Hardwick although I think his nickname was Toby Hardwick but um, that's not split hairs and um, it was a very uh, impressionistic piece was the mooch it, it gave you the idea of someone who you know was a bit of a uh, as in yiddish they would call it a schnorr i love that word a schnorr um someone who cadges cadges you know rather cadgy in personality so that's a good uh, reference um and of course um there's a lovely vocal version that Anthony and I were referring to, where I think uh, Baby Cox was almost sounding like a trumpet, mm. which was a lovely thing because she had a voice of the same range as a trumpet, you know, and she had that kind of blaring, almost sort of salty quality of a Cootie Williams or a, uh, perhaps um, Bubber Miley. Didn't he play trumpet about the same time? Yes, indeed. Okay. <laughs> or Rex Stewart, perhaps. Uh, lots of mute sure. and lots of really grimy, sort of seedy sounding. Oh, that oh yes. Was so well captured the by seedy sounding. Uh, well, you know, kind of. Yeah, kind no, of, the mute. Well, of course, it feeds back, into it feeds back. into what became known as the jungle style, didn't it? Exactly. Well, well spotted. Yeah, which was, of course, the band. Thank you, Frank. I guess it was. I guess, I guess it all linked together. That's what we're told about the Cotton Club, which was about a year earlier. Yes, or you know, ten months and earlier. On that so. topic, I want to apologize and repent again to a master of all things Ellington, Bob Hunt, who was a guest on this show, I think, two weeks ago, who was uh, excoriating me um, severely for my lack of knowledge about mutes. Uh, in Ellingtonia, which of course he's correct about, but Bob is Bob, you know, and it ain't going to change him now. And I have quite a lot of time for Bob, so thanks, Bob, 
uh, for joining us two weeks ago, and we hope to have you again. Definitely, always welcome. I found his comments about Goody Williams alone so so rich. Okay, yes, uh, Anthony, can we move on to a famous? Uh, Let's do that. Swing number. Oh yes. Uh, Duke wrote it. Uh, did an album called something about. Uh, we miss the big bands or something yes like that. that's right. one of the most often misquoted titles of a duke ellington album will big bands ever come back thank you um yeah. but wait, hang on which track are we going on to now we're going to play duke's version of a song uh, a tune that jimmy lusford recorded yes right so only. so this piece yes was um recorded around the same time as it the, was as a big bands thing um but I believe it came out on it was it was held back and came, well actually all the recordings were held back for a while I think but anyway well, this they, one was recorded in 1962 it was indeed um uh, a reprise is it reprise reprise that, that's right and it came out though a decade or so later on Atlantic on um the okay. uh well, what's it called now the other album but um, um a recollections was, of the big band era yeah just, yeah, thank you. Uh, just before um, you play it, Anthony, Lovely piece of music. I just want to say that um, it features all the greats in the band, uh, like one or two chorus, one chorus of these people like Goody Williams and uh, possibly Lawrence Brown, and a very little bit, like maybe a chorus of Jimmy Hamilton on clarinet. And this is Four Dancers Only, Duke Ellington, 1962. Right, that was 
For Dancers Only, written by Cy Oliver, originally in 1942, I think, for the oh. great Jimmy Lunsford band. Oh, 1937. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's why I have Anthony here because he knows every. I date. don't. I don't. I wish I did. It was one. Of, it's one of my biggest um, ambitions is to learn every day. Go on. And so, we're now. So you're still in the same kind of place, groove. Going to play you Jimmy Lunsford's version of that same composition uh, from presumably the late '30s. Sure. Anthony, you know. And just be able to compare it and see what you think about the different versions of the same song. <laughs> Dancers only, the Jimmy Lunsford Orchestra in 1937. Right. Pretty well, pretty good chart, eh? Very swinging. Not too fast. Kind of a, a medium lopey, lop, loping tempo. And only somewhat based on Christopher Columbus. Yeah, I think Christopher Columbus and his pal um, uh, for Dancers Only were close friends because they sound very similar to each other. Um, but let's not, you know, they had to play a lot of music in them days, didn't they? So the more tunes they could copy, the better. But um, the arrangements were quite similar, actually. I thought that Ellington's version was a very strong uh, nod to, to Cy Oliver's version. And no doubt those two chaps were friendly and you know knew each other and all the rest. Cy Oliver, of course, went on to uh, record an album, uh, I should say arrange and record an album with Sinatra. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, it was called, um, it was, I remember Dorsey. If you're a Sinatra fan, you'll know that he started a record label in the 1960s called Reprise Records, uh, which was contemporaneous with the Duke Ellington's and Count Basie's uh, recordings for the same label in the 1960s. 
And uh, as it happens, Cy Oliver lived a good life, and he wrote a piece um, in the 40s that he sang with a girl singer called Yes Indeed, which is a very big number in the, its day. It was kind of like a uh, patriotic song, you know, without being terribly red and white blue about it, you know. Uh, so we're going to, I just wanted to say, though, that Jimmy Hamilton, getting back to mm. the clarinet, <laughs> which I have to say we, you know, sort of fell off that thread a bit with the last two tracks. Uh, Jimmy Hamilton was playing in a style on Duke's version all those minutes ago that was not your typical Jimmy Hamilton in the respect that Jimmy was clearly a virtuoso clarinetist, you know, and he had a very clear kind of limpid tone which wasn't necessarily the style of Ellington's early clarinetists, you know, and he could play anything. Billy and, and Duke wrote very difficult clarinet parts for him to play, and he just nailed them. Technically, very, very gifted player. Uh, what I find interesting about Hamilton is that he took some tenor solos occasionally, although kind of deferred to Paul Gonsalves for obvious reasons. Um, and... Um, they were quite gritty and muscular in a sort of bassy style, uh, as opposed to uh, Paul Consalvis, who was a very innovative player, wasn't he? It was really intertwining quite serpentine lines, which um, made him Paul Consalvis and instantly recognizable. Um, so, so, right so, yeah, so, go ahead. So Barney, Barney played the odd, very occasional tenor uh, solo yeah. as well. Uh, and, and Alton, during, during his I period, I think he played tenor in the section, like you said. Yeah, and and I'm glad you mentioned that, Anthony, because we tend to o overly think of Barney as a solely a clarinetist, but he was a very competent uh, saxophone player, as you had to be in the Ellington band, because obviously, you know, it's a sax section, <laughs> although always, always riddled and ridden with the clarinet. Riddled with the clarinet, yes. So I was yeah. also, also just going to mention that much later on, Cy Oliver, I hope I got this right, he charted um, The Minor Goes Muggin for Tommy Dorsey, which features yeah. Duke, Duke Ellington at the piano. Well, that would make sense because Cy yeah. Oliver arranged for the Sinatra album I mentioned, which was called um, I Love Dorsey or something like that. So they're all songs that Frank sang with Tommy Dorsey um, in the early 40s before he went off and became Frank Sinatra. But as people know, um, Sinatra was very much a fan of Tommy Dorsey. And it's often quoted in books about Sinatra and stuff, my notes, that he learned his breathing from Tommy Dorsey, right. who, was a, who was a virtuoso trombonist, you know. And he really set the style for that kind of high singing trombone um, as if it were a vocal instrument. And one can argue that the trombone is the most vocal of all the horns. Now, you might disagree with that, those of you that like saxophone or trumpet. You get conditioned. In, in the Eddington world, you get conditioned to the vocal quality of Joe Nanton, don't you, on trombone? Well, uh, in the world as well. And arguably, obviously, uh, Bubba on cornet or trumpet, both perhaps earlier, um, but yes. Well, are you a fan Indeed. of um, uh, Juan Tizo? I am. Well, he he played a very vocal trombone, although as you know, he played what's called a valve trombone. A valve, yes. Which I'm sure um, uh, Robert Hunt himself would have had a few thousand words to share about. Uh, it's three valves, like a trumpet. But of course, it's a trombone, so it's lower. And uh, it had a very vocal sound to it as well. And Caravan, which hopefully we'll get to in a minute. Um, oh, did I, I didn't write it down. Okay, no, well, we didn't write it down, but we can do it anyway, yes. Yeah, uh, Caravan uh, was written by Juan Fiesel and uh, featured the, um, the voice, you know, the, the sort of lead melody on Juan Tizo's trombone, which is another very distinctive a aspect of Ellington. Um, so we're going to go now, because I think you have it queued up, to Warm Valley. Right. Uh, which is uh, recorded, in this case, by another Ellington alumnus, 
the great, great Scottish baritone saxophonist called Joe Temperley, uh, who actually joined Ellington, um, not when Ellington was live, but just after Ellington passed away, which was concurrent, concurrent with, um, sadly, Harry Carney's, Harry Carney's passing. I think it was the same year. Uh, and Mercer kept the band going, as you know, for a good 20 years mm. before he sadly passed away. Um, and uh, Joe was in that band. He recorded with the band a lot. And I did an arrangement um, of Warm Valley for Joe in about um, 2001, long time ago. But here we go with Joe Temperley's rendition of Duke Ellington's Warm Valley. Valley, Joe Temperley, and Frank Griffith playing clarinet there. Frank's just looking at some, just the, ah. just the very tip of his collection. <laughs> I have it. He has it. Okay. He's got it. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much, Anthony, for covering covering 
Uh, first of all, yes, that was recorded in, in 2001 at the sadly missed uh, Lansdowne Studios in London in Notting Hill. Um, uh, and um, it was Joe Tackerley on baritone sax and another great Ellingtonian, uh, English Ellingtonian, the great Tony Coe, who played on the album as well. Uh, although um, he didn't appear on that track. Hmm. Um, so it was an arrangement I did of four st uh, string quartet, the rhythm section, including our pal um, Andy Kleinder on the uh, bass, who Anthony has heard a number of times, as well as the fantastic John Pierce on piano and uh, great Steve Brown on drums. So that was quite a, a wonderful um experience to have a chance to play and record with Joe, who sadly passed away about three years ago, I think it was. Um, Joe, of course, uh, immigrated to the States in 1965 and uh, played with a lot of the great bands, including the Mercy Arlington Orchestra for a few years. Uh, and then he joined uh, the, he was a charter member of the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, mm. led by Winton Marcellus, and was in that band a good sort of maybe 20 years or so uh, before he kind of retired when he was in his mid 80s and then sadly passed away a couple of years later. Um, but the clarinet part, which you might have heard, was um, played and written by myself. And I um, decided to write that and kind of in, uh, add it to the CD because of the um, particular uh, style that um, I was trying to emulate, which is what Billy and Duke did a lot, where they would have a melody being played by a trumpet or a trombone or, uh, in this case, a baritone sax, and the clarinet would just be playing kind of what you call background fills and obligato. Obligatos, yes. yes. Obligati. And... Um, and that was something that um, Ellington did so well, well, both him and Billy, with um, writing for Jimmy Hamilton. So you have essentially a very simple melody. say it's a sad melody but it's got a kind of longing mm. quality to it um, which I would suggest that really was embraced wholly fully by by Mr. Tempoli who um, is a, just a re remarkable voice on the baritone sax but uh, he also played the, the alto sax and the tenor and the soprano sax um, so he wasn't just a baritone player, but um, he uh, he played with Humphrey Littleton. Okay, for those of you that know and remember Humphrey Littleton, uh, he was in one of Humphrey's first bands. In the uh, I should say his first gig was uh, with Humphrey Littleton in the late fifties, uh, which it was a band that also featured the fantastic Tony Coe. 
who I'm so happy to say is still with us and, and playing a bit. So that's quite exciting news. Uh, Anthony, do you uh, remember any um, DESIC involvement with Tony Co? Well, not directly, certainly not as a band leader. Okay, uh, I thought you might have had him perform at one of the conferences. I can't think of anything offhand, no. Well, he's still very much going, and uh, he's been, I'm in touch with him a lot about uh, Matters Ellington and clarinets and the anorakian things that clarinets... So again, play. a subject for our chat room. Do, does anybody here have an idea to what Duke was alluding um, with the title Warm Valley? Oh, well, that could be um, one of those discussions you have after this threshold. We'll do that after. i tell you what, we'll meet, we'll, we'll meet down the pub tonight, tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Oh, no, wait a second, they're shut, aren't they? Hang on. Yeah, yeah, I have to make it safe. Um, <laughs> okay. But no. you know, I'd like to now move. Don't go to any pubs, okay. anybody. We have so much great music here. And we yes, let's play it. some more music. Here's another song that I uh, mentioned before, which, of course, is Duke Ellington and Juan Diesel's Caravan. And it's done oh, yes. this time um, via uh, one of the great, great, great clarinet players on the um, earth today called Ken Paplowski. Oh, right. He's uh, American originally from Cleveland, Ohio. He's been based in New York. He's about my age. I won't say how old that is, but he uh, and I played a few times in New York and had the pleasure of working with him and writing arrangements for him and all sorts. And this is an unusual version of Caravan, which as we said before, was written in 1937. But this particular version is um, uh, with Ken, and a guitarist, uh, presumably from Brazil, maybe. Uh, his name is Diego. Uh, Anthony, do you have his name there somewhere? I do. I do have it somewhere <laughs> here. Let's spell it, shall we? F I G U E I R E D O. Yeah, for Geek, though. Yeah. Anyway, he, 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 he's either from South America or Spain. I'm sorry to be so. It sounds quite. Portuguese, that name, doesn't it? Oh, he's probably from uh, Leicester or something. I mean, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> well, he's an extraordinary guitarist, and Kenny um, is just a fantastic clarinetist, as you can imagine. And here's their duo vision. It's only a few minutes, maybe five minutes long, uh, of Duke and Juan's Caravan. Uh, so those, you know those first two songs, right? Oh, yes, first they're just back cheek announcing a couple of cheek. pieces no, that, oh, that they've played. Let the, let the blood and, start, uh, baby. We do know those songs, yes. Okay. Here's a song written by a man who played uh, trombone with Duke Ellington, Juan Tizal. This is called Caravan. Thank you. 
Well, that was Caravan, uh, recorded by um, par excellence clarinetist and saxophonist Timmy Soplowski and his um, uh, accompanist, uh, Diego Fugarado, who sounds like he might be from uh, either South America or Portugal. I'm sorry not to have done more research on him. Um, now, I also want to mention, as I usually do, that that was recorded live in 2006 in Portland, Oregon, which is ha very close to where I grew up, yes. uh, Eugene, Oregon. So that's kind of nice to, to, to know that. Um, as it turns out, um, um, completely off, off, uh, off topic here, there's been some very severe uh, firestorms in, Amer in, 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 in Oregon, which have also badly affected California due to long stretches of dry weather. And people often ask me, you know, where's your accent from? And, you know, where's Oregon? And, you know, what are you doing here? Whatever. But I often say that <laughs> Oregon's weather is very similar to England. It is. Yeah, it rains a lot. And you have days like today, if you're in England, uh, pretty gray for the most part. It's supposed to get worse to, uh, tomorrow, I'm, I'm told, um, as low as 10 degrees. But um, Oregon uh, uh, was withstood a very dry summer, and sadly, these fires um, started. And of course, um, that's what causes these fires to ravage the way they do. So uh, uh, for all those of you in Oregon, I uh, hope you're now recovering. I gather there was some rain recently, mm. so that's good news. Well, you can't... I don't think we have to worry about forest fires in England. No, not we? really, not just at this moment. No, in fact, it's some. You know, it's days like this, and obviously it has the weather has really turned uh, just in the last day or yeah. two. Um, but it's, uh, you know, days like this that make me wish that I wasn't broadcasting from outside. But anyway... Yeah. So, so just, just to finish up on Caravan, uh, yeah. it's a delight um, for um, saxophonists and clarinet to play. It's just such a winding kind of um, sort of Middle Eastern melody, you know. <laughs> you might be aware of Ella's recording of that song, which I believe was on the um, one of the uh, Verve albums with the uh, songbook, the Ellington songbook. Is that possible? Um, every every time, every time the Ella and Duke things come up, I have to look them up afresh. Uh, there were the two different. Oh, that's that's two, there were the two different. There were the two different. Um, albums which were produced a uh, small group and big bigger group yeah yes. there were there actually there was two big band albums done in the mid 60s ella at duke's place and another one um both of which featured all ellington and strayhorn songs and i think caravan was on one of those that um, makes sense did we play uh, it earlier i think we might have done share, share that with you or possibly it was the lambert hendrix and ross version that we played i'm not sure and but... i think I'm pretty sure, actually, just go back a couple of months, uh, Louis Gibbs, who uh, does a lot of Ellington, as you know, because I've been relentlessly flogging our gig coming up on the 29th of, of, um, of uh, November in Leeds. But with this latest kind of mini lockdown that the um, government has uh, foisted on us, uh, no one's sure about what's happening with live music. Well, know? I have a great deal of sympathy for the general 
uh, role of authority at this point in time. Whether one has a great deal of sympathy with the uh, Conservative and Unionist Party's governance of the United Kingdom at the moment is another matter, but uh, certainly everything is still uh, very much uh, up in the air, yes, definitely. So that's why we're sticking with the name of the programme. Earlier in the summer we were considering maybe changing it. Because we might not have to. no, we, I think we might. You know, honestly, we're just, at the moment we're just embracing it. That's the fact of the matter. And as I say, we've now got a YouTube channel up down lockdown as well. Yes, okay, uh, you can appreciate some. Uh, yes, some I was going to just throw into the whole forest fire uh, debate the fact that uh, fires happen naturally in forested areas. It's part of the renewal process for forests, and yeah, very and when. You know, you have huge amounts, as in California and up the whole of that coast, uh, huge amounts of basically unmanaged uh, forest, and you don't allow uh, fire to, to take hold occasionally. And okay. certainly if you build near or right in the middle of it, um, then you will end up with problems um, related to that, and it's just how things are. Um, so dry spells obviously occur, but, um, yeah. you know, as I say, in Britain, a lot of our woodland that's left because most of it was cut down to use the trees. Um, uh, yeah. but, most, but most of what's left is what's called managed woodland, uh, where they go in and deal with uh, dead trees and that kind of thing. And they take out and use a certain amount of the material for wood chips and for making furniture and whatever. Um, but when you've got just vast expanses of natural forest, um, that's an impossible task, really. Um, well, and so I mean, it's a it's a went, real it's a real problem for anybody who aims to be a custodian of that kind of countryside. Well, no, well, well um, expressed, and and I, I'm I'm with you on every uh, splinter of that speech. Uh, I would like to say though that we wouldn't be enjoying your wonderful woody environs of the jazz shed without forests. So, you know, I'm a great it. fan of cutting down trees and making things out of them. Just don't do it to excess is all I'm saying. And obviously around here we've lost most of what was basically oak. Um, there's still some oak, English oak, around, but uh, it's kind of relegated. Well, actually, there's quite, there's quite a few around here, but um, uh, it's not just oak. There's um, sycamore and uh, there used to be elm, of course. There's no elm really any longer. Uh, okay. Well, at the risk Beach. of becoming bored uh, ash. with this topic, chestnut. Um, bored. Oh. <laughs> um, it's a rather wooden joke. But anyway, um, a lot of people will be drawing a plank right now with this. But um, So, anyway, what, what have we got? Yeah, okay. So, that was Caravan, and that was lovely. So, let's we'll, go back to um, Mr. Hamilton. Number five. Number five, which is, of course, a wonderful standard song, presumably from the 1930s, called Tenderly. And it features these fantastic liquid and um, very um, uh, vertical clarinet of Mr. Jimmy Hamilton. This is from the classic Columbia recording, Indigos, from 1957, arranged by, well, it could either be Duke or Billy. We don't know, do we?
Uh, Ellington's arrangement of uh, Tenderly, written by uh, Walter Gross and uh, Jack Lawrence, probably in the 1940s. Um, now, Tenderly is a song that most of us play um, for gigs, you know, for background music, or uh, it's a lovely waltz. Now, mm. the version you heard there was 4-4 medium swing, kind of slow swing. Uh, but as a waltz, it's quite nice. jazz wall and uh, uh, the version you heard there of course um, featured some really kind of um, exciting and surprising piano interludes I, I found the ending just splendiferous um, Anthony you commented while the track was playing that you thought it had sort of a funny pre-ending can you uh, uh, expound on that. Oh, I don't want to expound on it particularly, but just it had a rather perfunctory near ending before that wonderful actual ending there. Uh, that's yeah. how I felt about that. Um, so it was well, kind of. Uh, yeah, I agree with you about that. Actually. Um, so it was a good. I mean, you know, if you were to hear it for the first time, quite a good surprise there. Um, I was just going to mention uh, we don't we haven't had a lot of things said in our chat room today, um, but there are a couple of comments. Firstly, Charlie. Uh, says that uh, he likes the selections. Some, he says, some cracking selections today. And then also Quentin mentions this. Um, on Tony Coe, he says, I have a vague memory of him playing with Brian Priestley and Dave Green at a desert AGM somewhere in Soho, not Ronnie's, um, around 2000. Oh, uh, and, true. and he Probably. also says... Um, some again again all this qualification with the sums <laughs> some lovely clarinet from frank today by the way he adds uh and then charlie agrees with that so that's good news do feel free when we are live to uh to join in there if you can get a word in edgeways that is of course <laughs> thank you guys well just just to say that um thank you quentin and charlie and yes i'm not surprised that tony was playing with Dave Green and Brian. Uh, as uh, Tony recorded an album in the mid 60s, and who was on bass but the great Dave Green? So, All right. um, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful Dave Green. Uh, musicians together. 
uh, as well as, of course, the um, Louise Gibbs album that we've played, mm. CD, I should say. Um, well, you can call a CD an album. Oh, it's definitely an album. Yes, it's one of the forms it's literally of album. An album. I mean, it opens up like an <laughs> it album. It does, exactly. <laughs> so anyway. Um, More so than many of us, yes. Uh, with Louise, uh, Louise and Tony and, and Brian in uh, about 2002 or so, early 2000s, uh, of all Ellington music. Um, and I, I believe we, we played a track or two from it, mm. uh, certainly when Louise was a guest uh, a couple of months ago. So yeah, um, Tony is um, just a, a world-class innovative musician who uh, I've been in regular touch with um, about matters clarinet and Ellington on a regular basis. So Anthony, do you want to um, talk a, a bit about the um, what we're up to, and then I'll introduce the last track or this or the penultimate track at least. Oh well, that's interesting because I was. I, well, we'll find out what track that is in a second. But um, <laughs> uh, no, I was kind of. Oh, I see. Yes, we do have a potential. A potential another. Yes. Okay, that's good. So I. Yeah. What are we up to? Well, well, what we're up to is producing these weekly broadcasts here, uh, live from around the country and the world. Um, I mean, we've been to. I don't know. At least two or three different countries, haven't we? Um, on Zoom Please. and <laughs> yes, and. And I spent some time this week um, putting the old programs up on YouTube, so do enjoy those if you wish. And consider uh, sending us a bit of a donation. Uh, it would be much appreciated. I won't take my hat off to hand it round because it's still pretty cold here. And it is. So, <laughs> I'm keeping my hat on, even though it's a bit of a dark hat to have on in, in the picture here, but it makes me feel less cold, so that's good news. We will have to move inside if we continue through the... Um, well, I hope we do. Through the, winter, through the winter time, yes, indeed. Well, yes, yeah. so indeed I hope we do as well. And to help us do that, please do consider donating. Again, please go to, oh, I'll put it up here. Why not, just briefly here. Um, our website, dukeellington.org.uk. Uh, go there and then uh, click on one of the links that takes you to Uptown Lockdown. And there you can see about donating either through PayPal or joining on Patreon. I uh, put that put that away, but then I've got to drag this one up again, so I don't accidentally put that back up in a second. Right. So Frank, our penultimate piece then. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's from uh, the Carbon Three Fleet. Oh right. Yes. Well, that's a link, isn't it? Yes. Uh, of course, is a um, uh, album I recorded. I've already told you about. However, one of the my favorite tracks on the um, CD is um, I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart. Um, sung by um, Trudy Kerr in this case, an arrangement by myself, and featuring the wonderful trumpet of um, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, British jazz trumpeter of all time, Henry Lowther, who should be getting a knighthood, um, and um, wonderful um, uh, treatment of the song, which really is based on. Um, uh, a vocal approach, uh, originally written in 1996 for the great Norman Winston, who uh, did a concert of Ellington music in um, the Isle of Jersey, which was uh, a site of an annual jazz festival, the Jersey Jazz Festival. And included in that group, I have to say this, was our friend Tony Crow and his clarinet part, which I play, uh, was written for Tony. So that's right. Nice. And, and there's a parting um, testimonial and tribute to the great and great Lee Konitz, who just died a few months ago, sadly, um, uh, who, uh, who also played on that concert. So it's kind of nice to be able to share this. This is um, Ellington's I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart, um, recorded in, in 2003. No, that's the wrong track. But that's curious. Oh. That's very curious because I queued up the right track. So oh, maybe it's my fault. I don't think it's your fault. Really? Let's, I think it may be its fault. Let's try. Let's try that again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, and it was going so well. Oh, well. That's okay. Someday. 
know I lost heaven Cause you were the song Since you and I have drifted apart Life doesn't mean a thing to me Please come back sweet music I know I was wrong song go out of my heart Believe me darling when I say I won't know sweet music Until you return someday I let a, Yes? I let a song go out of my heart Recorded uh, by my nonet in uh, 2003 and featuring the fantastic Trudy Kerr, who will be on again, we hope, soon. Oh, that would uh, be great, yeah. On Uptown, Lock Uptown Lockdown, because she's a wonderful, wonderful singer and a wonderful person to work with as well. And um, I want to thank you and Anthony for um, <clears throat> sort of enabling this session to share the clarinet and the Dukian sounds and Ellington and Strayhornian sounds of the great uh, clarinetist of Ellington and of course the great Ken Poplowski as well. So I think I'll leave it to my worthy constituent, um, Mr. Mr. Pepper, oh, to right. tell you about what's coming up. And okay, so, so, so yes, yeah, so we'll be back, or at least I will be. Uh, are you off again, Frank, next week? I'm off. Uh, to the um, Lake District. Oh, okay. So it's me then uh, next week, and we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, five o'clock on Wednesday, um, and yes, indeed, you said you know th thank you, thank you, Frank, so much uh, for, for being here. much appreciated. Love the clarinet playing, beautiful Thanks. stuff, and uh, you know our little survey. Well, your little survey. Sorry, through uh, well touching on. The, uh, particularly some of the later uh, clarinet work there. Absolutely. Excellent stuff. And as Charlie says, a good selection. Um, that last piece, of course, uh, although he said that before we played that last piece, but I'm sure he would include it. Uh, that last piece is on this CD, which if you wish to, uh, you know, you can buy uh, in no doubt a, a numerous number of ways, but in particular... Uh, on, on our Patreon drive there. Um, go to the, the Desert website and have a look at that. So to end with now, a piece that uh, was from uh, the band of another great clarinetist. Benny Goodman, Goodbye, written by Gordon Jenkins. And we're going to hear Ellington's version. Uh, same album, 1962. Uh, hits of the big bands, and this features the beautiful and memorable melody of Johnny Hodges, arranged by Billy Strayhorn and the eloquent and liquid clarinet of Jimmy Hamilton. <laughs> 